They lift here at 10 o'clock, and it's probably about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon where they are right now. <laughs> Eight minutes, 28 seconds, uh, standing by now for main engine cutoff. Stand by, this is critical. Okay, you certainly got a good bingo. That's the voice of Joe Ingles saying he had main engine shutdown. Confirmed shutdown. Uh, Columbia now returned to space, not yet returned to orbit. Uh, standing by now for external tank separation. Columbia Houston, you can ignore the IMU bite. It is in space, but it's not in an orbit that can sustain itself. It still has to burn at smaller engines, too. 8 minutes, 58 seconds. Confirm external tank separation. Oh, the big Columbia tank is gone. Big tank is gone. Another Columbia critical Columbia now fail. performing an evasive maneuver, moving below and beyond the external tank. Now Columbia is alone, right? Well, there's a few of us up there with 9 minutes, 15 <laughs> seconds. Go, no, go. Status check. Emission control for the first ohms burn. His own burn Roger, is, what Columbia, we're looking at him. is an orbiting, maneuvering rocket system they have to increase the energy. And it's also the rockets they burn to come back to space when they slow down. Columbia Houston, uh, your go for nominal ohms one. For ACU shutdown on time. Okay, Dan, and we're maneuvering to two now. Roger. Maneuvering Seven minutes, at 44 seconds. Uh, Columbia now maneuvering ohms one burn attitude using the two 6,000-pound thrust engines. Holmes 1 will be posi grade, uh, moving Columbia forward and higher on her flight path, placing Columbia in orbit. Posi grade, of course, is in the direction of the orbit. It adds energy to the orbit. It brings up their altitude uh, very so ever Columbia slowly. Houston, uh, we're convinced those IMU were software bites uh, right at Miko, uh, no problem. Okay, and we got uh, three on loop. Uh, I'll wait for that on camp, but we'll catch it in a minute. That's a communication from the spacecraft. Steve Bell and Joe Allen are uh, at the Johnson Space Center in uh, Houston, Texas, where Mission Control is located and where they are now uh, monitoring and directing and guiding this mission. We have another burn coming up pretty soon. Steve? Yes, Frank, uh, we have an Ohms burn coming up right here, don't we, Joe? Steve, it, it's burning right now, I think. Okay, and that is the final maneuvering of the rockets to put it into the orbit we want. How it's soon do we know we're exactly where we want to be? Uh, both Ohms engines look good going over the hill. Configure LOS, we'll see you in Madrid. Okay, Dan, we'll see you there. Burn up good today. We're about to lose contact with the spacecraft, but the yeah, engines were burning it's properly it's when it uh, went below the horizon of our tracking Roger, antennas uh -huh. on the ground. And so we'll see the next uh, as they come over Spain. But when we know that the Ohms burns were proper, that we've got it Roger, into the uh, direct position to make the full five-day mission. When they check well, back at Spain, seconds. we'll know right away. We have to do another burn later on, but uh, right. the Ohms engines have tested out uh, properly once again, and I think there's going to be no problem. Uh, I want to tell everybody that there was one very excited astronaut here as we watched <laughs> that liftoff. All of us were excited, but to know down to the precise second exactly uh, what's supposed to be happening and listening in on it all at the same time. Uh, have you heard anything in all the transmissions between the uh, spaceship, uh, craft, and uh, ground control that would indicate any kind of problem? just lost the signal here at Madrid. Uh, the spacecraft is beyond the horizon. Uh, we had an extended time of coverage and uh, saw the uh, Ohms engine cut off for the first Ohms burn. All right, the uh, loss of signal uh, will uh, stay in effect until uh, the spacecraft comes within range of the tracking station uh, at Madrid, and that won't be very long from now. As we uh, pointed out, they have already made the burn to place them in preliminary orbit, and then I guess uh, some 42 minutes into the mission, they will make the second burn to put them in their, uh, their regular orbit, about 157 miles or so above the Earth. David Hartman, the host of Good Morning America, has been here all morning watching it. David, what did you think? Well, <laughs> I'm sitting with Jim McDivitt and Harrison Schmidt. They've been up on top of these rockets before. They said it would be, it would be exciting. I think it was all right. <laughs> I must tell you, 
I just, I don't know how to... I better, I'm you not... tell him or we will. So, I thought we were going to lose him. Well, I was just shaking. I mean, it is just so beyond anything that anybody can comprehend, at least for me to comprehend. And uh, you can't imagine. Well, you guys told me it would be unlike anything that I'd ever experienced. Well, you know, that... And that's the understatement of all time. <laughs> it was so much more than I could even imagine. You know, this is a lot more like a Saturn V launch. And it, and it must have been the atmospheric conditions uh, that dampen some of the uh, sound and pressures that uh, one feels with a Saturn V during the first STS-1 launch. Right, the first time yeah. the shuttle went off. This time, you got that heavy, low-frequency sound. You got the crackle as it uh, got up higher. It just uh, super. I thought David uh, was going to jump off too. the platform. <laughs> Well, we had I, to hold him down. I must say, I recommend it to all of you <laughs> who would like an experience of a lifetime. This is one of them. This is really something. Thank God it went well. Thank the, God they're all right. Next step, David, you're going to have okay, to go let's, on uh, show okay, you what I'm ready. David, I just, uh, was oh, so excited seat. about. <laughs> yeah, here, here it is again. This is a replay now of uh, the launch that took place uh, 14 minutes ago, approximately. And what a truly awe-inspiring sight it is. Frank, uh, up she goes. The it looks feel, easy. The feel of it. <laughs> Frank, Frank I, can, I can appreciate David's excitement and enthusiasm, but if I may, I would like to say you exhibited just a little bit of that excitement and enthusiasm yourself. If ABC ever decides to put, uh, put a shuttle in space, I think you and David ought to be the prime crew. <laughs> oh, boy, I don't know. You better have somebody <laughs> else along the steer. I and think I'm going to send him alone, Gene. <laughs> this, this is where Jim and I had to grab David. <laughs> Okay, thank you all, gentlemen, as we watch a replay of uh, Columbia soaring into space. We'll pause for a moment. Our coverage of the Space Shuttle Columbia continues in a moment. Did you buy Reach into space. ABC News live coverage of the Space Shuttle Columbia continues. Now from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Frank Reynolds. The now empty pad. <laughs> there is the now empty pad. Launch pad 39A here at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. A moment ago we saw a bird just uh, wheeling in a sort of tranquil way around the uh, space uh, pad or the launch pad. The mission is now 17 minutes and 10 seconds or so underway. And the... Uh, Astronauts, while they soar above, uh, they're out over the Atlantic, well over the Atlantic, approaching right, actually the Madrid tracking station, I believe. Uh, while they do uh, just roar off into space, actually they go into orbit in a series of sort of steps, don't they, Gene? Yes, the, uh, the main engine puts them into a, an orbit, into space effectively, yes. but not into an orbit around the Earth that they could sustain, sustain themselves. So there's a series of uh, burns, as they say, of they, engine firings, really, that just move them right on up mm -hmm. to where they finally want to be and will stay for the, uh, for the full five days. Each, they have small rocket engines. They just put a little bit more energy into the orbit and so, slowly increase its size till they get it to the point where they want it. In this case, it's going to be about 150 statute miles mm -hmm. circular above the Earth. Yes. Okay, let's go down to uh, Houston now to uh, Mission Control or to the Johnson Space Center and uh, Steve Bell. Steve? Thank you, Frank. I'm sitting here with uh, Joe Allen, one of the shuttle astronauts. Joe, you've been monitoring the Mission Control line with the astronauts ever since liftoff. You've got a clock running right to the second here. Have we heard anything in the communications that would indicate anything other than perfect so far? No, it, it sounds, uh, sounds beautiful. They did have one, nuis what I'd call a nuisance alarm, uh, with a, a computer program that's called a built-in test equipment. They call it BITE. Mm -hmm. And you may have heard the Capcom say, ignore the BITE message. Uh, it's, it's nothing. All right. The, in other words, the astronauts were getting a message they that got there a message. might be a problem. They got a message that the inertial measurement units were acting a bit funny but have been since told to ignore that. All right, what's going on? We know that Houston, Houston Control is now in charge of the mission. Uh, what exactly are they doing to, I mean, is this all pre-programmed, all computerized, or are men actually making the uh, shuttle do what it's doing? If it does exactly as it's instructed to do, it is pre-programmed. Uh, mission Control is there to watch that that happens and really is not all that busy until it starts to deviate from that pre-planned. Primarily a monitoring function yes. at this point. Yes. How, how about aboard the spacecraft itself where you've got two astronauts? Uh, are there, is theirs a monitoring mode? Uh, it is to a degree, although they have tasks to carry out now. They, they have to shut down the APUs, the things we heard so much about in the last few days. 
They ran the required few minutes time, ran beautifully. They're also uh, shutting down uh, the, or cleaning up the, the big engines, making sure all the leftover propellant is dumped out the back end of those engines. That's done manually? It's, it's done using Activated, switches, yes. yes. All right, so they're getting ready now for what will be their first major assignment uh, as pilots or as onboard operators. Uh, really, as, as you said earlier, to open the payload bay doors right. to, uh, first of all, make sure the computers are instructed with the on-orbit instructions uh, and properly configured for their stay in orbit, and then to open the doors. What are they thinking by now, that first look at space? Well, they're, bu they're busy. They're probably not looking out all that much at the moment, but no they'll, they'll have plenty of time later on. Yes. Thank you very much, Joe. Now back to uh, Frank Reynolds at the Cape. Okay, Steve, thank you. Uh, yes, we just have had an indication that uh, something was 14% high. I missed part of that. What was well, it? Well, one of their auxiliary power units that we've heard so much about, oh. uh, they're about ready to shut them down, but the temperature got high on the number three unit a little early, and as Joe did, uh, or excuse me, as uh, Dick truly did, he monitored it. He d made a decision on board to shut that number three do unit down about uh, 10 or 20 seconds early. Uh, appears to be no problem.